record button too, sir. I got it, bro. Go. I got right. it. Most valuable currency there is. How will you serve the world? What do they need that your talent can provide? That's all you have to figure out. Why not take a chance on faith as well? Not religion, but faith. Not hope, but faith. I don't believe in hope. Hope is a beggar. Hope walks through the fire and faith leaps over it. You are ready and able to do beautiful things in this world. As a child, my parents always told me you can be whatever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do. But I didn't totally believe it. Yet I went out in the world and I carried myself and I held my head high. And I stood there and I looked people in their eyes and I talked to people as if I was deserving of everything that this planet has to offer. Confucius said one time, he who says he can and he who says he can't are both usually right. It's time to change. It's time to walk down another street. What is your dream? I just want to ask you one question. What do you want to be remembered for? I hope you want to be remembered as a grinder. Someone who fights their way through all the things that they go through. Do not give up on your parents. Do not give up in school. Do not give up on your goals and your dreams. If you want to be an athlete, grind. If you want to open up that company, that organization, grind. Nobody has to convince you to do what you have to do. Wake up, bird. You stay up, bird. God damn it. You will do whatever you have to do to get where you need to go. Who gave me five grand when I was in Michigan State doing my program? I didn't get a, I didn't have no budget. But I didn't need a budget. I had a dream. I didn't need no help. The president never came and said to me, E.T., we're going to help your program for this institution, bro. The president never came, and I never quit. I never gave up. Why? Because it wasn't her dream in the first place to take care of people kids from the D. It was my dream. It was my goal. I don't expect you to do, I don't expect you to believe in my dream like I believe in my dream. And the problem with some of y'all is you want somebody else to support your dream. It's yours. I don't know you a dime. It's your dream. If you want it to happen, get your butt up and make it happen. If you want it to happen, rise and grind. The warfare is in your mind. It's not in your checkbook. It's not in your savings account. It's not on your job. The fight. Just putting it out. It's about what are you doing with those hours you're putting in. 
stay focused in accomplishing every single goal, every single day. We're trying to reach a pinnacle point. Nobody else can give you the effort that you need. Nobody tells you when you're successful. You know when you're successful. You know if you put in enough time to become great. You know when you're good. There will be times when you feel like giving up. You just got to go one more mile. You got to go one more day. I guarantee you'll find that motivation that you need. There's something that's built on the inside of you that man cannot give you. Your life, your health, your business, the situation that you're going through, everything that you've been through should push you to your destiny. Today is the day. Good stuff right there, man. I heard that. I heard that. Oh, yeah, a little feedback. feedback. Well, I heard, uh, I heard, uh, whoa, whoa. All right. I heard, uh, I heard that this morning. First thing, man, it's a great way to start today because, you know, I know, uh, Adam is on here and, uh, you know, one of his things is, you know, grinding, man, and, and always grinding in this ISA game, man. It's, a, it's a grind. It definitely is a grind. I mean, we're not going to lie. It, uh, I, you know, we, we talked about a couple of weeks ago. I know some of you may not have been here. Some of you were. Some of you um, may have had a hard time uh, um, getting that uh, that session we had two weeks ago. Um, I will tell you that uh, Adam has uh, uploaded it to uh, YouTube. You go to YouTube, the Adam Bailey uh, channel, and uh, you'll get the presentation that we did two weeks ago. Um, good stuff there. Had uh, had some nice feedback from that. So um, if you uh, were dropping out of the call. I was doing that call from a hotel room um, in Indianapolis, and um, bandwidth wasn't that great, so we were dropping out a little bit. But if uh, you want to go back and listen to that session, or if you're new here and you want to go back and listen to that session from two weeks ago, go right ahead. Um, but it's there for you. You guys probably see it on my screen right now, okay? Um, but this is a grind, man. This is a, th this game that we're in here. This is not easy. I said this two weeks ago. Um, there's a lot of people in this call right now. You're on this call because people have hired you to do something that they don't want to do. Some of you are here because you have a rainmaker who, quite frankly, is too busy to do um, what it is um, that you're doing. Um, and uh, they, they need somebody who can do it at a high level. Um, this is not easy. We don't pretend it's easy. Sometimes we act like it's easy, but we know it's not. It's not easy to come in, sit down for six, seven hours a day, dial a phone call, deal with negative people. Right. But, uh, you know, we got to grind and we got to get better. It's continuous improvement. You know, in the business world, they have, uh, you know, ISO 9000, ISO 9001, quality, continuous improvement, always getting better, always refining, getting better at your percentages. That's what we're all about. We start out in the foundations program and uh, we learn you know, we learn those basic concepts. We learn how Select Homes does business. We learned uh, internet, uh, um, you know, word word tracks, and we learn outlines and uh, Boomtown uh, internet lead conversion, or or you do an internet lead conversion out of another system. We learn how to call on FISBOs and expires, and we understand what the talk tracks are and a little bit about the psychology. This session here, this afternoon session, is about getting better at the details, about continually honing. And I said this in front of our uh, agents group about a month ago, maybe three weeks ago. I said, you know what, if you're in this room right now and you think you're as good as you can be, then I feel sorry for you because you always got to get better because prospects get better. They got more information available to them. They need us less and less. So we got to get better and better and better. We need to short circuit um, our ability um, or, our, you know, we need to short circuit their ability to get rid of us faster. Right. We got to get better at what we do. And if we don't continue to hone that skill, we don't continue to grind every day to get better at what we do. You might as well just pack it in, man. I know a lot of people. I know a lot of real estate agents. I know a lot of professional salespeople who consider themselves professional salespeople. And I said this two weeks ago. They've been in the business for 25 years. But they haven't learned anything since the first year. They haven't been in business 25 years. They've been in business one year, 25 times because they're using the same tactics, the same tired scripts, the same tired outlooks, the same tired pitches, the same tired moves. And they just expect everybody just to just play along. 
So we're going to continually work at getting better and better and better in what we do. And this is what the sessions are all about, these afternoon sessions, getting incrementally better uh, one little step at a time. Um, first thing as I always do, I want to go over some victories. What are some uh, um, some good things that have happened in the last two weeks? Anybody who wants to, either type it in and I'll read it or open up your mic and just uh, go start to talking. What are, what are some good victories? I've had a lot of victories. I'll get into mine in a moment. Um, let's hop into some of yours. What, what do you got good for me you can share with the group? Okay, hey, Mike, this is Dennis. Go, Dennis. Hello. Okay, hey, yeah, um, <clears throat> I've been working on a, training a new ISA, and her name is Shelby. She's been with us just almost three weeks now. Shelby, is this week so far, has set six qualified appointments. Uh, it's all about the conversation. You know, she's been listening in on the training calls every morning, and uh, she's she's far ahead of where I thought she would be. Um, so <clears throat> I really think that the victory is in the fact that um, she's really listened to the training and has implemented all of these things that she's learned, and uh, the results are starting to come in. So I'm really excited about that. And on top of that, we are we're modeling our call center. Uh, all the systems and everything after you guys because you know, of, of you know, who you are and what you can do and accomplish. So um, I really think that our victories this week are, are outstanding. I'm happy about that. I'm looking forward to what we can accomplish next week. Well, great. I appreciate that, Dennis. I mean, uh, a couple of great victories there. Um, I heard a, a couple of things. One is she's taking advantage of the opportunities that she has, you know, from our coaching program. You guys that are on this call, um, some of you are rainmakers, some of you are ISA, some of you are a combination of both. Your money has been spent. We've made our, our call center available. We try to train people the way we would train them if they were in our call center. And how would you call? How would you train somebody from the call center? You would come in, and they would shadow people, right? They would sit with people and they would listen, and they would do that every day. Every day they would do that. So even though. You're on this call right now, and you're an ISA, or you have an ISA, and say, well, they just do internet leads. They don't do FISBOs and expires. Are you trying to tell me there's nothing they can learn by being on the call listening to FISBOs and expires just because they don't make that kind of call? Because I hate to tell you, after about 20 seconds into the call, the call is the same call. It's still a buyer or it's still a seller. There's still things to be learned. So just because it may not be targeted to exactly what you do, there's stuff to be learned all the time. So I'm not suggesting that you have to be on every single call we have, but I love the fact that Dennis said his new ISA is, in fact, on every call. Because if there's only two things a new ISA should be doing, training or dialing, nothing else. No getting ready to get ready. Get in there, plug into what we have, and we find the people that plug into our systems and do what we do, they're the ones who are successful on these calls. The ones who have a little bit of ego, a little bit of arrogance, with, oh, well, you know, that's not a perfect call. And, you know, my, my, I'm actually better than, you know what? There's stuff to be learned from everybody. I learn stuff from you guys every day. And that's why I continue to ask stuff like, tell me your stories. The second victory I hear there, Dennis, is, is that you made a good hire. It sounds like you, you uh, really thought about who it was you wanted to bring in and why and how. So it's a victory for, um, in two ways. So thanks for sharing that. There's all kinds of victories out there, folks. There's small ones. There's big ones. What other kind of victory do we have? Somebody type something in there. Mm -hmm. I'll share a victory, Mark. Hi. Who's this? Jasmine. Oh, hi, Jasmine. Hi, Mark. We haven't spoken in a while. That's probably why you don't recognize me. Well, yeah, not since yesterday afternoon, if you recall. <laughs> okay, so one of the things I would like to, to touch on, and I'm not saying that there's a better way of coaching or there's, um, you know, better formats, but I will say this. Um, I attended the Mike Ferry seminar, and um, I was able to learn a couple of days before that the knowledge and training that he was delivering, I learned more with select homes coaching phone calls than I did in a four or five day seminar. Um, you know, everybody has a different way of teaching and at the end of the day, it's, you know, bottom line is the same thing. You got to have a routine. You got to have a schedule. You got to know 
uh, what your approach is, what approach works, overcome the objections, get the pain. But I will say that you guys are doing a stellar and amazing job at delivering it in a fun uh, way for us as ISAs to relate. Um, yeah, I'm not saying that you're better than Mike Ferry, or maybe I am, but um, bottom line is that you guys are doing a great job. And that was a victory that I was able to overcome. Compare the difference of what I've learned with uh, Select Homes versus uh, Mike Ferry. Well, thank you very much. And um, I'll say it, I'm better than him. Okay. I, mean, I don't want to get sued. I, I'm just, I'm just joking around. I'm just joking around. Um, I've never spent any time with him, so I couldn't tell you if I was or not. All right. But uh, no, I, I appreciate that feedback. Um, let's see here. I got a, somebody just typed one in here. Um, let's see here. Good news. Uh, we have increased our listing and buyer's appointments. Last week we made 12 appointments between three ISAs. Um, you know, let's continue growth, man. That's great to hear, Ariana. Um, you know, continued growth there. Uh, we want to continue to get to the point where, you know, we're getting uh, even even better results than that. So I, I appreciate you being here on the call. You guys had a good week. Let's get let's get an even better week. So good job. Um, let's learn a few things to help you make us uh, do even even better. So I appreciate everybody sharing that stuff. Um, you know, I don't I don't do it to get uh, you know, positive feedback for me. I want the group to hear what other people in the group are doing because you guys are our peers. Right. You guys are doing the same thing. Some of you may have been in the business for five years in ISA games. Some of you may only be in for three weeks. It's important for you guys to hear what the other victories of the other people so you can relate to what it is that they are doing. Right. So that's a very important part of uh, of this process here. I also want to get an opportunity to share with each other the good stuff and the bad stuff that's going on. So let's do a little uh, let's do a little review of uh, from two weeks ago if you don't mind. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I really, really dug into, um, went back and reset um, some of the core of what we're trying to get across from an ISA standpoint. We talked a lot about scripting. We talked a lot about uh, um, um, word tracks. And you've heard Adam and I both say that we don't really like scripts. And I want to get something straight. We do utilize call outlines, and if you want to call them scripts, so be it. I like the term outline because it, it is a structure of a call. I've heard uh, Jasmine use that term quite a bit. Also, Adam uses it. It's the structure. Everybody has to have a structure. I don't want my ISA just going willy-nilly, just hopping on and just chit-chatting because that's called professional visiting. I know a lot of professional visitors, Okay. From a uh, from a professional standpoint, we need to have how we're starting, where we're going, and have a plan to get there. We need to have a roadmap. Our scripts, if you want to call them that, our word outlines, our talk tracks, they are our roadmap. We want to get from A to Z. There's certain points we need to go through to get there. But that is not where most of the work is done. That's like 20%. The 80% that's not on that piece of paper makes a difference between you and somebody else, right? And we really looked at the fact that what's not important as much as we say, if we look here at the graph up here, this communication graph, if you remember, only 7% of what somebody remembers after an um, interaction, after a communication interaction, are the words that are actually spoken. You don't remember what people say. You, may, you remember what they look like and how they made you feel, right? When we get on the phone, it's all about tonality, man. It's all about how you carry yourself. It's all about how you sound. If you sound down and tired and just moving through the motions, the people are going to be down and tired through the motions. If you're over the top and all giddy and great, guess what? They're going to hang up on you, man, because that's some baloney. But you do need to have a posture when you're on the phone. I call it, um, you know, an executive posture, like selling like a CEO. That's how I look at myself. I'm a CEO of my world. I'm a CEO of my business. I'm a CEO of my day. And that's how I'm going to carry myself with confidence and with a posture that comes out when you hear me speak. And that's how I want you to be heard. 
We have some great people in our ISA um, bunker there in Wichita. You know, I listen to Barbara a lot on call night. I really like the way Barbara speaks. She's fun. She has, uh, you know, great rapport with people. She laughs a little bit, but she's in, she's in charge of that call. Does that mean that she knocks every one of them down? Heck no, man. There's some hard nuts out there. But I really like the posture that comes through. She's, she's happy to talk to the people and she's happy to help them. And people get that vibe. And so if you get a chance to really listen, next time you listen to Barbara on one of the calls, don't listen to what she says. Listen to how she sounds. Listen to her voice. Listen to her tonality. And I think uh, there'll be some good lessons to learn there. Okay? Really be, be, be careful of how you sound. The next thing we talked about a couple weeks ago, <clears throat> we talked about uh, softening statements and reversing. Right? We talked about amateurs and we talked about professionals. I had an opportunity last week to watch an amateur and professional side by side. Um, and the reason I say that is, is because they were both answering questions. They're both answering the same question. But every time the question was asked, the amateur said, well, that's a good question. Now, there was probably 10 questions asked. Nine times she said, that's a good question. And once she said, that's awesome. The professional has multiple softening statements. They have, that's a good observation. Hey, you know, help, I appreciate you asking me that. You know, um, you know that, that's a really good one. Um, you know, good, good point. They mix it up. They have a vocabulary that is beyond what they learned in the first year. So as I watched these two people go, go, you know, side by side answering questions, I really was struck by here's the exact definition of what I've been talking about. Somebody who's learned something in the first year and just keeps repeating it over and over and over again and hasn't done anything to increase their talent. This little chart you have right here in front of you, the art of getting your questions asked. This thing here is beautiful. When somebody asks me a question, it's, you know, can you tell me more about that? Help me understand. You know, you asked me that for a reason just now. It sounds like that's important. You, know, you seem to have a lot of experience in that area. You know, help, help me understand where you're coming from. That sounds really important to you. Why did you just ask me that question? Uh, one of my favorite ones is I'm curious. I'm curious. Could you help me? All of these questions, now we haven't gotten to this, but all of these questions on the right-hand side all come from transactional analysis. Transactional analysis or how people communicate um, and the different um, directions they come from, the different ego states they come from, and how you move people in between from, from a parent ego state to an adult ego state to the child ego state, how that happens has a lot to do with the triggers that you use, right? There's triggering phrases that you can use to get people to get into a place where we want them to be. If I want somebody to be in an emotional spot, if I want them to share with me their hopes, their wants, their fears, their desires, I've got to get them into that place where they feel comfortable sharing that information with me. I'm not going to get them into that place if I keep saying that's a good question because guess what? I sound like a salesperson and people do not like to connect their inner child ego state to the big scary salesperson. So quit saying that. There's nothing wrong with saying that's a good question. There's something wrong when you say it over and over and over again. You're screaming, I'm a salesperson, forces them to stay in that protective parent ego state, which will not allow them to be vulnerable and give you the pain-oriented information of which you seek. Learn more than one softening and reversing statement. Expand your vocabulary. That is how you're going to get people to start looking at you differently because you're not going to be saying the same triggers as everybody else. Fair. And the rest of our session today is all about being different, by the way. I also dropped this on most of you guys last week. Some of you have seen it before. Um, some of you haven't. 
And this is um, a little uh, mechanism we use called iceberg. It's still misspelled out because I haven't changed it yet. And this is nothing more than a questioning technique that's built from transactional analysis that is designed to take people from their parent ego state through their adult ego state to the child ego state, in which they can be vulnerable and share information with you. And all of you guys thought this was about reading a script. Mike Ferry. I'm not going to pick on Mike Ferry, but what I'm going to pick on are people that keep telling us and keep training salespeople the same way, the way that they trained them 50 years ago. And 50 years ago, all they did was memorize scripts and then go out there and pass them to the world. Well, you know what? Sales and sales training has evolved just as the population has evolved. I get sick and tired of seeing the same people teach the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And what that forces us to do is work twice as hard and we never get to see our families and we never get to see any time off because we got to work 10 times as hard as we should because we're doing the same thing over and over again and prospects don't like it. They hate it. They don't even want to deal with you. They'd rather just buy a house online. Because I can buy my insurance online, I can I can trade with my stockbroker online. They would just assume buy a house online, most of them, if you ask them. They can't right now, but they would if they could. Why? Because they don't want to deal with salespeople. Why? Because we're using the same tactics we did 50 years ago. That's to not listen and shove information people down people's throat, whether they want it or not, and then turn around and say, so, when should I meet you? Four o'clock Wednesday or five o'clock on Tuesday? What? What? Huh? What? You don't even know anything about me or my situation yet. This thing in front of you has made me a lot of money. I would suggest that you learn those questions and you see those dotted lines. Basically, that's what we call the three levels of pain. And it's a it's a, an exercise where I get people to open up. I don't use every question all the time, but however, I do use questions from each one of those areas. So if you were to uh, you know ask me a question such as um, so if you were to give me um, you know hey I want to move to uh, I ask somebody location you know what look at, where, where are you looking at moving at and the person says well I want to move to Maze I wouldn't say well what price range do you are you looking in right because that's on the script I'd say well Maze that's a that's an awesome community I appreciate you sharing with me hey I'm just curious can you help me understand. Why are you guys uh, attracted to that community? And they say, oh, well, we really like it a lot. And I'd be like, tell me more about that. And they tell me a little bit more. And I'll go, wow, you guys sound like you've really done some research. How long have you guys been thinking about moving there? And now they tell me some more information. And I can continue down this little exercise here. If you notice, I use two questions from the first part, and then I use the third question from the middle part. They weren't exactly as written, but they were versions of those questions. Fair? So these are all, all these little techniques that I'm mentioning here to you. These are all things that we work at throughout the program. And we'll, we'll go back to these things often because they're currents that run through and weave through everything we talk about, every level of our system that we use to sell with. Okay? Um, let's bump back here real quick. Some of you may have seen... This little uh, um, home, this little house over here on the right-hand side, select homes, we call this lion selling, and this is nothing more than a graphic representation of the process in which we use to sell. The process I use to take somebody from the first time I met them to them saying, yes, I want to do business with you. Whether it's, yes, I want to meet with you after a phone call, or yes, I want to actually sign buyer's agency with you. The process is the same. This is what I really work through in these sessions. And we break these floors down one at a time. And then we also look at the different ladders in between that connect all this stuff. Okay. Let's um, take a look at something here. Got a little video for y'all. Thank you. 
you having it all? <laughs> Where were you? I went to the beach. Oh, the beach! <laughs> It's not working, Jerry. It's just not working. What is it that isn't working? Well, it all turned out like this for me. I had so much promise. I was personable. I was bright. Oh, maybe not academically speaking. But I was perceptive. I always know when someone's uncomfortable at a party. Did that happen over there? It all became very clear to me sitting out there today that... Every decision I've ever made in my entire life has been wrong. My life is the complete opposite of everything I want it to be. Every instinct I have in every aspect of life, be it something to wear, something to eat, it's all been wrong. <laughs> Tuna on toast, coleslaw, cup of coffee. Yeah. No, 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 wait a minute. I always have tuna on toast. Nothing's ever worked out for me with tuna on toast. I want the complete opposite of tuna on toast. Chicken salad on rye. On toasted with a side of potato salad and a cup of tea. <laughs> well, there's no telling what can happen from this. You know, chicken salad's not the opposite of tuna. Salmon's the opposite of tuna. Because salmon swim against the current and the tuna swim with it. Good for the two. Uh, George, you know that woman just looked at you. So what? What am I supposed to do? Go talk to her. Elaine, bald men with no jobs and no money who live with their parents <laughs> don't approach strange women. <laughs> Well, here's your chance to try the opposite. Instead of tuna salad and being intimidated by women, chicken salad and going right up to them. Yeah, I should do the opposite. <laughs> if every instinct you have is wrong, then the opposite would have to be right. <laughs> yes, I will do the opposite. I used to sit here and do nothing and regret it for the rest of the day. So now I will do the opposite and I will do something. Excuse me, uh, I couldn't help but notice that you were looking in my direction. Oh, yes, I was. You just ordered these same exact lunch as me. <laughs> my name is George. I'm unemployed and I live with my parents. I'm Victoria. Hi. <laughs> Can doing the opposite of what you know be the key to unlocking your sales success? Or, as I like to call it, if everyone else is doing it, you need to stop doing it and you need to do something different. I want to hit you guys between the eyes today with a higher level concept. Um, it's called opposite selling. Some call it reverse selling. Um, it's even in the realm some people would call negative reverse selling. Um, this is a higher level concept that if mastered um, changes your philosophy to selling and quite frankly, it could change your life. Now, that's a pretty bold statement, but I've seen it change people's lives. I've seen it change careers, turn careers around. I've seen it take people from being broke to quite frankly, being very prosperous. I've seen people use it in their relationships that were near divorce. And uh, now have fulfilling relationships and have went on and continue to be married and have kids. This is some powerful stuff. Will we get to all that stuff today? No, we won't. <laughs> I'm going to introduce some basic concepts to you today that will build throughout the program when we work together, um, as we work together. Um, the, the underlying theme here, just like old Mr. Costanza there, just everybody loves George, right, is maybe we should – start doing some things differently than we have been doing them if we want to get some different results. Maybe the way that I've been going to the market, it, I should do things differently. For instance, a couple of weeks ago, I used a, uh, 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 a little bit different graph. Um, I used the, the, the graph called the dummy curve 
Well, it turns out the dummy curve is uh, um, trademarked and proprietary. So I can't use that. However, I do have this graph. And I can use this graph all day long. And basically what it shows here is on the left-hand side, as you go up the graph, the number of dollars you earn, right, um, is greater. And as you go to, from the left to the right, it's a percentage of talking. So the less you talk, right, your percentage goes down. It's an inverse relationship here, right? So I'm talking less here, and I'm talking more here at the bottom of this curve, right? And I'm – and I'm uh, um, so – Talking less at the top, talking more at the bottom, and I'm talking less again up here at the top. And as you notice, if I go from the top here where I'm speaking less, and as I speak more, the money in my pocket goes down, right? And I, as I learn to speak less and less and less and less and ask better questions and do some things differently and really work on my listening skills, et cetera, my income actually goes up. Um, it's often said that uh, the person who speaks the least says the most. And I saw a great meme the other day somebody commented on, which was, you know, the, the people who seem to have the most money seem to have the least amount to say. That's because they're spending a lot of time listening a lot of times. <clears throat> right? So there's an inverse relationship between what people want and what we give them as professional salespeople. Because what we give professional salespeople is we give them speech. We give them talk. We talk, we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk, we talk. And we don't spend as much near as much time listening. I found in my career, though, the less I fight the urge to talk, the more money I make. The less I fight the urge, the more I fight the urge to talk, the more money I make. Why is that? Because at a base psychological level, people want to be heard and they want to be understood. Your prospects are people. From a psychological level, your prospects want to be heard and they want to be understood. There's only one way you can do that, and that's by listening. Yet, what are we taught? We're taught, say this, say that, read this, read that, memorize this, memorize that, right? Once again, we have to have a structure of a call, but a structure of a call does not help us listen. It doesn't have to help us ask follow-up questions. If somebody objects, hit them with this. If somebody objects, hit them with that. How about you seek to understand why they're objecting? When somebody says, hey, Mark, that costs too much, is it time for me to jump in and start building value? Or is it time to stop in and say, well, could you help me understand? You said it costs too much. Does that mean you would never under any circumstance pay it and I'm crazy? Or are you saying you don't see the value of why you would spend that much money for that kind of service? Is that is that my understanding? He said, well, yeah, I don't really see and understand the value yet. OK, now I understand what I need to do. All I did there was soften and reverse, gather more information. Now I know the impact of my answer and I can give them my answer. So what we need to learn to do instead of trying to learn every objection handler out there. What we need to do is we need to learn a few rules that if we deployed them, we could actually eliminate many of the objections before they ever happen. If you get a lot of objections in your, in your selling business, whether you're on the phone or if you're out there in person in somebody's office or they're in your office doing a buyer's consultation, presentation, et cetera, if you get a lot of objections, quite frankly, it's probably because you tried to close too soon. If you get a lot of objections, one, you haven't really found their, their base emotional motivation, their need, their pain. Two, you close too soon and you haven't really listened to them. That's when you get a lot of objections. I don't get a lot of objections when I work with people because I don't close too soon. I close when the time is right. And I go a long way in understanding the person I'm talking to. Now, I could teach you guys some of these rules. 
But my guess, and we have a couple of directions we could go right now. There's some other things I could work on. But my guess is it'd probably be a waste of time to sell the to tell you guys these rules. I mean, what do you guys think? Should should we work on this now, or should I go on to something else? You tell me. Or would you rather just work on objection handlers? Keep going. <laughs> Okay, I'll just wait. <laughs> just wait for someone to answer. In a negotiation, it's always the person who speaks first who loses, right? All right. There's three types of prospects positions. You have to understand prospects come in three sizes, three types. They come in the positive prospect, the neutral prospect, and the negative prospect. There's really only three kinds. So now I don't have, first of all, I just eliminated a boatload of work. All I really have to do is understand what kind of prospect is in front of me. Are they positive? Are they neutral? Or are they negative? The best way to uh, think about a positive prospect is, you know, they're happy to see you and they want what you got. Right? Um, somebody give me an example of what a positive prospect might say. Type it in, open your mic, do whatever you want. What are the kind of things you might hear from a positive prospect? Thanks for calling. Thanks for calling. All right, what else might they say? You could say, I'm glad you called. Um, good to hear from you. Right. Um, they may say, they may say, I heard good things about you. Right. You could say, um, and you call and you say, hey, I'm from DFWHomeSecrets.com, blah, blah, blah. And I say, oh, I've heard of you guys before. Right. And you're thinking to yourself, sweet. They may say something like, I mean, really positive, like we're ready to buy. Or, man, I'm glad you called today. We were just getting ready to call you. Or, wow, you're an agent? Fantastic. My husband and I are looking for a house. All great stuff, right? All positive stuff. Anybody remember back to Lion's Selling sesh class that I did? Um, what is the prospect's first step in a buyer's process? Anybody remember the first step in a buyer's process? We have a process. Buyers have processes. What's the first step in a buyer's process? I know somebody remembers it. Hello, is this thing on? <laughs> the first step in the buyer's process is to lie to get you excited is to over embellish their position to get the salesperson excited so the salesperson will want to help them. Have you ever noticed that the most positive prospects always have a tendency to disappear? They always have a tendency to have problems on the back end. The happier you are to see you, the more issues you end up having with them. So some things we have to be careful with positive prospects. We'll talk about those a little bit more in a moment. The second type of prospect is a neutral prospect. They're, they're, they're not unhappy to see you or unhappy to hear you. More likely it's the, uh, uh, well, you know, we're just looking. Um, you know, we're just kind of checking things out. They're not saying go away and never call me. And they're not saying, hey, we're ready to buy right now. We get a lot of neutral prospects um, in the Internet game. A lot of you are dealing with a lot of neutral prospects. Right. And there's a way to handle neutral prospects and then the way to handle neutral prospects. We'll talk about those a little bit more in a moment. But it's really is I just got to get them to move. I got I just can't have them sit there in the middle. I got to get them to go positive. Heck, I'll even be happy if they go negative. But I just got to get them to do something. And we'll talk about that. The third type of prospect position out there is a negative prospect. And we've all heard that. What kind of things does a negative prospect say? I'm sure you guys would be easy to answer this question. Go ahead. Somebody hop on.
I already found a home. Get my number. Like yeah, look at that. And people are fighting to talk now. I already found a home. Actually, that's not a negative prospect, Javier. That's not even a prospect. They're disqualified. They already bought a house. Don't want to talk to them. Would somebody else throw something out there? I don't remember. I don't remember. Say it again, Shelly. How did you get my number? How did you get my number? I, absolutely. A neg you're, they're coming at me from a negative position. They may be negative, but we're not really looking necessarily. Somebody doesn't have to be a jerk or an ass to fit in the negative prospect. We're talking about a buying position. This should actually should more accurately say um, up here, it should say instead of prospect. Oh, oh, made a mistake. No, hold on. Push the wrong button. Right. Um, wow, I deleted some slides, man. Hold on. Thank goodness for the back button. It should more accurately say instead of three prospect um, positions, it should say three buying positions. Because you have to take away the voice inflection and you have to take away the emotion out of it when you're dealing with these people. We're simply looking at their position. Somebody could be smile right to my face, be really great with a real nice southern drawl, say, you know, boy, I just don't think you're the right person for me. They might not be, but their position is negative. Not necessarily their attitude. Then again, some prospects are freaking jerks. But just because somebody says, well, you know, I'm not interested. I'm going to work with somebody else. You know, but they're polite to you. That's still a negative position. Okay. A positive position, a neutral position, and a negative position. If I can recognize what position you're coming from to me, I can apply some simple rules to know how I need to act or react based on your positioning. Not necessarily on what you're saying, but on your positioning. So I'm always categorizing prospects. Are they positive, they neutral, and negative? Positive, neutral, negative. Right? So when they come at me, I'm trying to figure this out. Now, very confusing for a lot of people is actually hold on, the positive prospect. Here's a lionism. Never trust a positive prospect. If I just met you, if I just called you out of the blue and you're happy to take my call and you're happy to hear from me and you've heard great things about my company, my radar goes up immediately. Remember right now, remember George Costanza? Maybe I ought to start looking at things differently than the way I've looked at them before. Maybe I ought to start doing the opposite of what my heart is screaming at me to do. What my behavior has been in the past has been when I get a positive prospect, I get all positive. Great. You want, you're ready to go. Perfect. And so what happens is we start throwing our process to the wolves and we don't ask the good, hard hitting, solid questions that we know we should be acting from professional because they're ready to go. Oh, I got a cash buyer only in town for the weekend. Got to make us got to make um, an offer by Friday, right? Cash offer. $300,000, only in town for the weekend. I better drop everything I'm doing and run out there and do with them. Why? Because my pipeline sucks and I might not get another opportunity. When I get a positive prospect, the first thing I can do is tell myself, all right, Mark, calm down. You might have something here. You might not. Let's make sure we ask them the same questions we ask everybody else. I'll give you a perfect example. I don't know if they're on this call or not. A couple weeks ago, I had somebody call me and say, hey, Mark, this is their exact answer. This is the exact words they said to me. Mark, I want you to take my money. I'm like, uh, okay. Um, can I ask you some questions first? Said, what do you mean? I, I, I want to get in your program. I want you to, I heard about your program. I want you to take my money. And I said, hey, that's great, Mrs. Prospect. I understand that. That's cool and all, but you know what? I'm not sure yet if you're a good customer for me. Would it be okay if I asked you some questions to see if we're a good fit? And she was like, uh, okay. So it doesn't matter to me how positive somebody is or how negative somebody is 
or how neutral somebody is, I know that buyers have a process and the buyer first step in the buyer's process is to lie to get me excited. So what's a way to get a salesperson more excited than anything else? Wave money in their face, right? Walk right up, got me some money, cash buyer. I don't care if you're a cash buyer, I could care less. The money that goes into my pocket is the same. Cash buyer, not a cash buyer, need financing, don't need financing, don't make no difference to me. I don't get any more commission. Unless, of course, maybe, you know, that cash is actually going to help them get the deal done higher at a higher price or whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm going to treat them the same way. They're a positive prospect. A positive prospect, I'm going to do the opposite of what everybody else does. I'm not going to get super excited. I'm going to go low key and say, hey, Patty. I need to ask you some questions. And then she said, well, you know what? I heard I heard great things about your program from, from Bill. Most people would go, great, that's fantastic. And they would miss the boat. Right then and there, you have to go slightly opposite of their position, slightly negative of, of a positive prospect position to say, really, what have you heard about us? And she goes on to say, well, I heard you got a great dynamic program. You know, you're really helping a lot of people with that model. Um, you know, it really sounds like the thing that we need. Um, I don't know about you guys, but who's selling who now? I'm not selling her. She's selling me on keeping her. She's telling me all the positive stuff she already knows about my program. Right? But here's the deal. She's super positive about my program, but she doesn't know how much it costs yet. Guess what? When we start talking about money, maybe she's not going to be so positive anymore. She may start being a little more negative now, right? When she finds out how much all this costs. When you get a positive prospect, you have to learn to slow down, get your voice down, get your heart from going, take the, take the commission glasses off, get rid of your commission breath. Right. And say, oh, OK, cool. I'd love to work with you. You know, we've done a fair job with um, with with other companies. I'm not sure if I could do that with you yet until I understand your situation. Could you help me understand a little bit what's going on over there that you think that I might be able to help you? Now, think about this from a phone call standpoint in the ISA Center. Right. We may get somebody that says, wow, yeah, you know, we, we've been on your site. We're, we're, uh, we're really interested. You know, we're really looking for a house. We really need to get started. And you think to yourself, fantastic. I'm still going to ask them the exact same questions, right? Hey, great. I'm glad um, you guys are in that position. May I ask you, what brought you to this place where you guys are so, so ready to go? It's just a slight movement to the negative from their positive position. Slight movement to the negative from their positive position. Instead of, hey, that's great. Let's start customizing a website and set you with an appointment. It has to, it has to be, hey, I, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm really happy for you guys. What brings you guys to this place? And then they'll just start bowing up and telling you. Because once you understand their pain, now... I can move forward and I can start to close. I can't close. You close too soon. I'll give you a perfect example of closing too soon. Many years ago, I had a company and um, I went out and I was, just, I was brand new. I only had this company about three months. And I went out and I met with this IT company. And um, I was going to sell them services. And I met with the owner and uh, we met with him for about 45 minutes. He, uh, um, that was all the time we had that day. He asked me to come back the following week. And the following week, we would go over, you know, what was going to be in the program, you know, how it was going to run. And then we were going to, you know, make some decisions on what to do next. All right, cool. So I show up the next week. When I go in and bring me into his office, he's a typical IT guy, right? He's on the phone, got two or three screens going. He's checking emails. He's doing all this stuff. So I'm sitting there right across, right across from maybe 10 feet away from him. He's on the phone. He finally gets off the phone. He spins in his chair and he says, so, Mark, what do we need to do to get started? Now, I don't know about you guys, but when you hear somebody say, what do we need to do to get started? What does that mean to you? Somebody, just somebody throw it out. You made the sale. Right. And that's where I went wrong. <laughs> and I said, well, 
Hey, I, that, that's great. You know, well, what we need to do to get started is, you know, I need to sign this contract right here, write a check. Let's go. And he said, no, Mark. What I meant was, what do we need to do to get started with our meeting today? I haven't made the decision yet that I want to work with you guys. Wah, 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 wah. Guess what? Mark didn't get a sale that day. Because I went all super positive on him. Instead of learning my lesson, which I have learned, which is to say, if somebody says to me, what do we need to get started? I'll say, so when you say get started, what do you mean? That's all I would have had to do. When you say get started, what do you mean? He goes, well, where are we going to start today? What kind of information did you bring me? You said you're going to bring me some information about your program, et cetera, et cetera. Ah, uh, I probably would have made some money that day. But I turned him off immediately because I went all super positive. And the reason why I turned him off is because I became a salesperson with my super over the top positive attitude and pushing this thing through and closing too fast. And he didn't like that. And so he found a reason to get rid of me. And I guarantee you that happens to some of you. I really like the fact that somebody's in the bathroom right now. Make sure you wash your hands before you leave. <laughs> so when you get a positive prospect, when you hear those things, when super over the top, when you got those guys that are in town just for a day or they're, they're going to be there, they got to find something right away, slow down. Slow down, do the opposite of what everything inside of you is telling you, which is to go super positive and take your time. Slow down, go negative of their position and ask the questions that you need to ask, regardless of what kind of prospect they are. When you do that, you're going to get all of your questions answered and a lot of the objections that you missed earlier will all come up when now you try to get them to sign the piece of paper. Because you never really – you, you jumped ahead. But that's what they do. That's what prospects do. They jump you ahead. Now, a lot of you are saying on here right now on the call, well, hey, Mark, that's really not my problem, man. My problem isn't positive prospects. My problem is negative prospects. Hey, we're going to get there. Relax. Let's look at neutral prospects. Neutral prospect is the worst kind of prospect. This guy will kill you. We call them looky loos. We call them, you know, I'm just tire kickers. We call them all kinds of names. I love the name that Anthony Parniello gives them in his book called Selling to Vito, which is a great book, by the way. He calls this kind of prospect Seymour. Anthony Parniello breaks down two different types of buyers. You have Vito, which is a very important top officer, and then you have Seymour. And you can relate this to, to um, you know, Holmes as well. You know, Vito is a guy who is making decisions, who's looking for a house, who, um, you know, has made the decision that they need to move, um, and they're actively involved in it. That's for our world. That's a veto, right? Seymour is the guy who wants to see more of this and see more of that, right? I want, I need, uh, um, I need some. Uh, some tables, I need some statistics, and I need some stuff on that neighborhood, and I want to see 14 properties, and you know, I'm just out looking right now doing research. There's nothing wrong. Seymour can become Vito, but you got to recognize when you got stuff with Seymour on your hands, right? Um, Seymour's will kill you. Seymour's will say stuff like, well, you know, I think it would be okay if we meet um, – but, you know, I'm really not really that sure yet. And so what you do, right, you push through and you schedule the meeting anyway. And then they just don't show up. Because Seymour is wishy-washy as heck. Seymour, he doesn't really care. He, he doesn't esteem you or your time. So, but you push through because he sounds kind of positive because he said, well, yeah, I guess if you hear somebody, if you hear wishy-washy words like I guess or maybe or I guess that would be okay or oh, oh well, yeah, I, that would be okay. When you hear that, stop. <laughs> stop. That's what's going to affect your uh, your show rates. You need to make sure you're getting solid commitment from people. And when I hear that kind of wishy-washy stuff, I will stop. I will go negative their position. They're neutral. I'm going to go a little bit negative. I'm going to say, well, you know, you know uh, Betty, it sounds to me like you're maybe not that sure yet. Can we talk about that a little bit? Maybe I haven't done a good job yet of asking you some of the right questions. 
and just say, okay, well, take that back. You know, maybe we weren't really in a spot yet where you were ready to meet. Can you help me understand that? And then she'll show you three or four things out there. Now you know what to work on. You know what specific issue she has, right? So now you can deal with that stuff, okay? When you get a neutral prospect, you just want them to move. I don't care if a neutral prospect moves and says, yes, let's meet, or they say, screw you, go away. Quite frankly, it doesn't matter to me. My, uh, I don't have a need for approval where it really bothers me either way because I know the one in the middle is the one who's going to take all my time. I'm going to be on a phone call with this person for 25 minutes. I'm going to call this person back over and over and over and over again. We have ways to deal with veto. We have drip campaigns. We have ways to get information to them. Um, we have all kinds of technologies to build mind share with them. Not every prospect is right for you. And so we want to ask the right kind of questions, but just recognize that somebody is neutral and um, not really doing anything right now. Neutral is really the hardest prospect to deal with. And quite frankly, it takes me the most amount of time and training um, and repetition to help people get past the neutral person. One that most people deal with is this guy. Everybody wants to know, how do I deal with this cat here? The negative prospect. What are some of the things negative people say? Give me, give me, a, give me, give me some negative stuff. I know you guys are, are, have heard that before. What's that? Why are you calling? I'm gonna hit with an agent. Don't call again. Yeah, don't call again. Why are you calling me? Right? So there's different yeah. levels. Just like there's different levels of positive, there's different levels of negative. Negative could be um, anything from, you know, thanks for thanks for giving me a call, but you know, I'm not interested. Right? That's negative. All the way to go to hell, you sleazy bastard. Never call me again, you shyster scam artist. Right? It can be anywhere in between. Unfortunately, a lot of us here, I'm not interested, and what we envision is go to hell. Right? I don't, everybody gets that. When you make the volume of calls that we make and that some of you make, you're going to get some of those people that are saying, you know, they're, they're red-faced with horns, right? Most of the people are just saying, no, thank you. I'm not interested. Now, if you're calling on FISBOs and expires, you're probably going to hear, you know, the percentages of people telling you to go away. But even people are – sometimes people are fairly nice to you and say, hey, you know, you're the 10th person I called. I'm really not interested. Thank you for your call. And then they hang up on you. But they said thank you for their call before they hang up. It's not really a hang up. It's really they're just done with you. And they said thank you, and they hung up. If I'm going to hang up on you, I'm not telling you thank you. I'm just saying screw you. I'm hanging the phone. Or I'm just hanging it up and moving. I'm not even giving you any indication. Let's not confuse somebody with a buying position of, hey, I'm not really interested, to go away. Two different things, right? For me, a negative prospect is actually the easiest prospect. Why do you think that is? Anybody have any idea why a negative prospect is the easiest prospect? Very clear. It is very clear. There's no wishy-washy stuff, so I know where I stand, right? Delete them. I mean, at that point, you either decide to delete them or maybe follow up at a certain time, but you're really clear that at this point, you know, you're not working with them or giving them a whole lot of your time. That, that, that is true. Absolutely. We know where we stand, where we're going to go. No's or yeses are great. No's are good. Maybes are the ones that will kill you, right? No is great. Move on. Get somebody else. But there's a couple other reasons, too, especially if they're on that, that, that really super, you know, 10 people have called me. Why the hell are you calling me? You know, if they're already emotionally involved, half my work is done. All these other questioning techniques, transactional analysis and building rapport and, um, um, you know, um, softening statements and reversing statements and iceberg techniques and uh, all this different stuff. All that stuff is designed to help me get somebody emotionally connected. This guy is already emotional. Uh, I just saved myself 40 minutes of an interview or 15 minute phone call. This guy's already, um, he's already got pain. 
I just need to learn how to deal with it. This guy doesn't scare me. This is, this is the challenge. With great tension comes great opportunity. You take somebody like this and turn them around, they're going to tell everybody how great you are, what a great salesperson you are, what a great agent you are. When I met this guy, man, I was ready to kill him. He turned it around. He did a great job for it. He's going to tell everybody he flipping knows. The referrals you're going to get off this guy are going to be amazing. But a lot of us are like, oh, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? No problem. Guy's all pissed off. I can't believe you guys are calling me. I can't, you know, why do you guys keep calling me? I don't want to sell my house. Sir, sounds to me like you've had a, 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 a bad situation. Sounds like you're having a hard time of it. My guess is, even if I would try to convince you that I'm completely different than everybody else, that, you know, I sell more homes, you know, um, than anybody else in the market for a higher price and less amount of time. My guess is, even if I could show you that, None of that wouldn't make a difference because you've already decided that you're so pissed off, you're not going to deal with anybody, and you're just going to quit and give up on your dream. Is that fair? Now, he may have hung up on me in the middle of that sentence. But he's negative. I'm going to go more negative relative to his position. I'm not going to go more negative on an emotional basis because this isn't emotional with me. I got 150, 200 people I got to call today. You just happen to be on the other end of the line, man. You're negative. Hey, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know if you're, you know, your your daughter's in drug rehab. I don't know if you just lost your job. I don't know why you need to sell your house if you're middle of a short sale and the government's coming. I don't know. I'm just making these calls, bro. Right? So, guys, all pissed off. Sir, it sounds to me like you've had a, uh, you know, a hard day and uh, you've had a, a very, you know, negative time of it. My guess is, even if I could convince you that we were the right company. We were the right people. We could sell your house faster than anybody else could sell it. We could get this thing out of stress you. My guess is even if I showed you all that, you would still say, no, thank you, because you made up your mind, and this is just too negative a situation. So I probably shouldn't even try. He's either going to say one or two things. He's going to say, you're right, click. Or he's going to say, well, I don't know, maybe. Hey, man, I just need a crack. And then I would say to him, well, help me understand. A moment ago, you were ready to hang up on me. And if I was standing there, you'd probably punch me in the face. But now you said, maybe, what would the circumstance have to be for you to even entertain talking to somebody again? Well, they'd have to do things a lot different than my last guy. Okay, like what? Now the guy's swinging, man. Now I got a crack in it. If he hangs up on me and goes away, I don't care. I'm going negative of his position. He's negative. I'm going to go slightly negative of him, not emotionally, position-wise. So I have three positions I'm dealing with. I'm dealing with positive people. If they're positive, I'm going to take my time, go a little negative, slow it down, ask them the same question I need to ask everybody. doesn't matter if you're waving money in my face. makes no difference to me, man. I got a process. I'm taking you through it. If they're neutral, I need to get them to move. I don't care if they move negative or positive. I got to get them to go. I'm going to go a little bit negative their position to get them to move. The guy says, uh, well, you know, we, uh, you know, we're just looking. Hey, I understand. A lot of people are just looking. Adam's really good about this. Hey, a lot of people are just looking, man. They're just, when we first meet them, that's where they're at. But hey, if I had a magic wand and, and you could wave it, when would you like to be in your new house? That's the opposite of what everyone else does. Everybody else tries to talk him into it. Hey, I'm just, I'm agreeing with you. I'm just going slightly, slightly negative, slightly opposite. Use the term opposite if you want of where other people might go. If they're negative, I'm going to go slightly opposite of them. I'm going to go negative, go slightly more negative than them. The guy wants to tell me to go to hell. Hey, no problem, sir. I appreciate the fact that you're upset and you've had a bad day. My guess is that if I talk to you anymore, I'd probably just piss you off even more. Is that fair? <laughs> It doesn't matter, man. It's all fun. This is a game. If you're not having fun doing this, why are you doing it? Go find something else to do. The guy is super negative, but keep in mind, not everybody who says, I'm not interested, has horns and is breathing fire. Sometimes the guy says, I'm not interested. Hey, that makes sense. I talk to a lot of people, and when I first meet them, they're not interested. But I work with a lot of people. I make a lot of calls every day. And when I hear that, a lot of times people are saying, you know what, they're thinking about buying a home, but they're really a long way out. 
And there's a lot of circumstances that have to change between now and then. So I'm just curious, is that maybe where you guys are at? Well, yeah. See, that probably more accurately reflects. I'm not interested to, yes, maybe, which now I can say, well, you know what? Here's what I can do for you today. And now I can go into what it is we're going to do. So we need to start understanding buying positions and how to deal with them. I just dropped a lot of knowledge, a lot of information on you guys. I don't expect you to walk out of this call here and start doing the opposite of everybody else and going negative their position. And this is what I would like you to do. The next time in the, in the next week, this is the best place to start this thought process. The next time you hear somebody say, hey, thanks for calling me, or I've heard a lot about your company, or I'm glad you called. I want you to stop and think to yourself, okay, let me take my time. No, don't, don't go over crazy. Oh, that's fantastic. Take your time. There's nothing wrong with saying, hey, that's great. Would you mind if I ask you a few questions? It's going to completely get them off their game out of their process and drop them into our process. Because I'm telling you right now, their process is not designed for you to make a lot of money. Our process is designed for you to, to, to take a customer as far through the process as possible so you can make a determination of whether or not you should spend more time with them or not. Because that's how I protect your money. Fair? Let's, uh, I got a little video here. This is an example of a great negative reverse, the great doing the opposite of what a prospect expects. Take a look at, at her. There's two people in this here, in this video. Take a look and listen to her buying position, okay? Think about her position and then think about where he goes relative to her position. Now, this guy here, this guy is a traditional salesperson. Watch how he handles business. And then watch how Hitch handles business on the back end. Okay? First guy, traditional. Second guy, lion selling. If you catch this, this is what we're doing. This is what we're working on. This is what I'm teaching you. Glass was getting a little low, so I took the liberty of bringing you another apple martini. Thank you. And I couldn't help but notice you look a lot like my next girlfriend. What's your name? They call me Chip. Ah, oh, you can't get him to stop? <laughs> that was funny. Listen, Chip, I, I understand the courage it takes to walk across the room and try to generate a relationship out of thin air, so don't take the following personal. You have fantastic eyes. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, homie ain't listening too well. <laughs> homie ain't listening too well, is he? Is he? He's not on script, man. Yeah. But see, she's not on script. But he's gone. He's powering through his script. You know what? He's got what he's gonna say. Don't matter what she says. He's got what he's gonna say. Does this start to sound familiar, folks? Thanks. Try to listen. Uh, but this is no reflection on you. I'm just not interested. But thank you for the compliment of coming on. What kind of buying position she have? Was she a negative person? Was she nasty? She got is she breathing fire? She got negative. Uh, does she have you know uh, horns coming out of her head? No. But what position is she right now? She's negative. You're welcome. So do you like Cuban food? Jim, seriously, that was not code word. I wish you'd try harder. Are you always so shut down and afraid? 
the right man might make you feel like a natural woman? <laughs> Sorry I'm late, honey. I couldn't get a cab. Uh, how was the meeting? Oh, well, there was a, a beginning, a middle, and an end. Nice to meet you, Chip. You too. Now, on the one hand, it is very difficult for a man to even speak to someone that looks like you. But on the other hand, should that be your problem? So life's kind of hard all around. Well, not if you pay attention. I mean, you're sending all the right signals. No earrings, heels under two inches, your hair is pulled back, you're wearing reading glasses with no book, drinking a great goose martini, which means you had a hell of a week and a beer just wouldn't do it. And if that wasn't clear enough, there's always the fuck off that you have stamped <laughs> on your forehead. Because who's going to believe that there's a man out there that can sit down beside a woman he doesn't know and genuinely be interested in who she is, what she does, without his own agenda? Yeah, I wouldn't even know what that would look like. So what would a guy like that say? Well, he'd say, my name is Alex Hitchens and I'm a consultant. But she wouldn't be interested in that because she'd probably be just counting the seconds until he left. Thinking he was like every other guy. Which life experience has taught her is a virtual certainty. But then he'd ask her name and what she did for a living. And she might blow him off. Or she might say... I'm Sarah Milas. I run the gossip column at The Standard. And then he'd ask all these penetrating questions about it because he was sincerely, if atypically, interested. No. No. He'd be interested. But he'd see that there was no way he could possibly make her realize that he was for real. Well, he could be funny and charming and refreshingly original. Wouldn't help. Don't you hate it when that happens? Not really. They both probably go on to lead the lives they were headed toward. My guess is, they do just fine. It's a pleasure to have met you, Sarah Milas. I could do a two-hour session just on that five-minute video. The moves that he makes, the opposite direction that he goes, how he takes her from a negative prospect to as he leaves is actually past neutral into positive. How he did the exact opposite of everything that she thought he would do and why it worked. Stop being chip. Start acting more like Hitch. You guys have a great week. Thanks, Mark. And can you bring a little more value next time? Thank you. Bye. Bye.